All right, before we get into chapter 9, we're going to just look back in chapter 8 real quick because I kind of closed up the sermon last week a little bit quicker, but I kind of skipped over these verses because I knew we'd be covering this tonight. It just made sense to not really go into it at all, but um, it, it's going to help give the context. Obviously, in chapter number 9, what we see here is ultimately it's the story of Abimelech. Abimelech was one of the sons of uh, Jeroboam, Gideon. And he was in one of the illegitimate sons. He was born through a concubine, not one of his, you know, 70 wives or however many wives. He had many, it doesn't say how many wives. He had 70 sons, but he had many wives. And um, he also apparently had concubines. And we get that from, in Judges chapter 8, verse number 30 says, And Gideon had threescore and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And his concubine that was in Shechem she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. So it's, it's setting up the scene for what we read here in Judges chapter 9. It's basically telling us that this Abimelech, this wicked man, this wicked Abimelech who we hear all about in Judges chapter 9, he, uh, he's the result of being a, a, basically a bastard child of a, of a concubine of Gideon's. And, you know, Gideon was a, was a great guy. He did a lot for the Lord. He was a great leader in many respects. Um, obviously, the whole time that he judged Israel, they didn't turn away from serving the Lord. But as soon as he was dead, we saw at the end of chapter 8, they, they turned from serving the Lord and went back to their old ways of, of wanting to, to worship and serve Baal. So it's just important to understand that, that Shechem, you know, People do things that are not right, and I'm not going to preach on this really at all, on, on the, the fact that, you know, having multiple wives is not something that's condoned in Scripture. It's not something that God intended to do. It's not something that we should do just because people did it throughout history, just because even people who were used of God and did great things of God had multiple wives does not mean that it's something that God wanted them to do. Uh, the Bible t talks about in just one instance, in many instances, but in one instance, you know, uh, the king is not supposed to multiply wives unto himself. Now, Gideon wasn't a king. He refused to be a king. But at the same time, I mean, whether it's a king or, or anyone else, you shouldn't be multiplying wives. I think the, one of the reasons why it makes sense just for a king, because it's possible for a king to multiply wives just because a king is going to have a lot more um, money, you know, a lot more financial support to be able to support that many wives. I mean, to have a lot of wives, that costs money because the, the man's supposed to be providing for his wives, let alone spending the time and everything else. But I don't want to get into the whole thing on, the, on that. But the reason why I'm even bringing this up, this is his concubine. And, you know, when you make mistakes, because this is definitely a mistake for him to be going in unto his concubine and having a son by him, you know, sometimes the ramifications are huge. He probably went to his grave thinking, wow, I, you know, I've done a lot. I've served the Lord and I have, I have 70 children. His posterity, right? His sons, 70 sons. And not even talking about daughters. He's got, I've got 70 sons that'll, that'll follow after me, right? What a comfort or peace of mind that probably was to him. But then, not much longer after that, he's got a wicked son that he had with his concubine that goes and kills basically all of the other, all of the children that he had. Now we know that, that, you know, one got away, but what a, what a great loss that is. What a great, uh, great destruction that all came years down the road, much later on as a result of that action that he took with his concubine and having that concubine and having, you know, a child with that concubine. And, you know, this is just one more example. The Bible has many examples like this on how serious just, just committing those sins can be. And, you know, watch out for fornication. Watch out for, for doing these acts and getting involved in these sins where at the time you might think everything's going great. 
At the time, you don't seem like there's any problems or any, any negative consequences as a result of your sin, and you could fool yourself into thinking that everything's just fine when it's really not. And it wasn't the case here. Now, I don't know if Gideon reaped anything further on down the road in his life, but I guarantee you that, that you know, that's still an impact for him having lost his children like that. I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. No one, I wouldn't want that to happen to my kids after I pass on, right? Just because I'm no longer here doesn't mean I would want that to happen. I mean, I'm still alive. When I die, I'm going to have, I have eternal life. I'm still going to be alive. I'm going to be in heaven, you know, and I'm not going to want those types of things happening to my children, to my flesh and bones. And that's, you know, he had that happen to his, and that's a result directly of his own sins. Now, um, let's get into the story here in Judges chapter 9. So this is Abimelech, verse number 1, And Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem. Whether is better for you, either that all the sons of Jeroboam, which are threescore and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. Now, <laughs> I think this just shows us how stupid people can be. There's so many things going on here. They, they get behind Abimelech because he is their brother, right? And what's going on here, you know, the, the people of Shechem, they're not of the children of Israel, right? They're, they're of the land of Canaan. They were in there before. You remember Shechem when way back when Jacob went into the land and, and one of the sons of Shechem laid with, with Dinah, his daughter, right? And then um, his other sons, you know, Levi went in and, and they went in and um, destroyed, you know, just killed a lot of men of the city. And uh, that was a story that happened, you know, much earlier than what's happening here. But it's still, you know, this group of people, that's why he had, it's probably why he had that, one, that woman, that wife, or that, the concubine of the men of Shechem, because he didn't want to marry her because she was of the heathen, but he still wanted to have her. Right? He still wanted to have her as a girlfriend. He still wanted to have a relationship with her, but because she was she of Shechem, you know, it was just this thing on the side. And um, Abimelech is the result of that. So Abimelech goes on to, you know, his people. His dad was a Jew. His dad was Gideon, right? His dad was, was a great man. He goes on to his mother's household and speaks in the ears of the people there saying, well, do you, you know, do you want 70 people reigning over you or do you want one? And, and hey, don't forget, I'm your brother, right? I'm, I'm your flesh and bone. Now, first of all, how stupid is this that these people are going to get behind him because he's their brother and by getting behind them, they support him killing his brethren. They're like, well, wait, hey, I'm your brother. Yeah, you kill brothers. I don't think I want to have anything to do with you. You're going to, to go and murder other people that are your brother, that are just as much his brethren as these other, actually more so, because these other people, they're not, you know, his mom didn't give birth to all of them. They're the extended relatives of his mother, whatever, you know, his, his, his grandfather's household and stuff. But you see what I'm saying? Like, you say, oh, you're, you're, my, you're my brother. You're my people. Well, so are your half-brothers. And you killed them. This is how stupid people are, though. And you know what? This is the way that politics works. It's obvious. And this is totally politics. Why is it? Because Abimelech wants to be king. He wants to be in charge. He wants to be the ruler. He wants to be the one that everybody lifts up and praises. And you know what? He's in it for himself. Do you think he really cares about the people of Shechem? No, he's trying to get an angle. He's trying to get an advantage so that he can be in power because that's what he wants. And you know what he doesn't want? He doesn't want to share the power with anyone else. He wants it all for himself. But he plays this angle of saying, oh no, 
You don't want to have these people rule. You want me because, you know, I'm, I'm your people. You know, what, you know what reminds me? This reminds me perfectly of Barack Obama. Barack Obama. Barack Obama had a white mom and a black dad, right? But what does he do? What is he catering to? All the black people. Just say, hey, you know, and, and all the people that are so ignorant to vote based on the color of his skin, even though he, he was white and black. He's white and black. So what, is he white? Is he black? Well, he's both. He had literally one of each parent. So how can you say, no, no, he's black? Well, he's just as much white as he is black. But he's going on to a certain people saying, well, I, hey, you know, I'm your brother. Hey, you know, get, get me in, in here. Get me in the office, right? But did he really care? Does he really care about black people? No. You know what he cares about? Himself. And if he can do so by playing politics and saying, hey, I'm one of you. Vote for me. Get me in the, get me in the office. Then he'll do it. Because he doesn't care about the people. It's not about principle. It's not about being righteous. It's not about being godly. It's just about getting power. And this is exactly what Abimelech did. And you know what? All the politicians do it. They're going to pander to whoever. I mean, just as much as a white guy would pander to, to white people or whatever, whatever advantage, whatever angle they think they could get, you know, who, whoever, however they could use it. Mitt Romney's going to try to, you know, angle the Mormons or whatever, right? And I don't think any of them are sincere in any of their, you know, beliefs or, you know, these, these wicked people that just want to rule over others. That's right. Yeah. That's right. They, they don't have what's right in their heart. Gideon had what was right in his heart. He wanted what was best for the people. He didn't want to rule. He said, no, I'm not going to rule over you. God could rule over you. But that's not the way that Abimelech thought because he wanted to rule and he didn't want to share with anyone else. That's why in his wicked heart, he wanted his brethren dead. And he didn't want any, and, and he wanted to be king. Because remember, as long as Gideon lived, there was no king. He judged, but he wasn't the king. But notice, too, that the people, they still really wanted a king. And we're going to get that a little bit later when we go into that, um, the analogy or the, the, the cursing that um, Jotham pronounces against these people. Because they still, even after all those years of Gideon, they just want to have a king. And they're willing to just say, yeah, we'll go with you. And, and the way that, another way that... Um, <laughs> that Abimelech is pitching this to him. He says, well, would you rather have 70 rulers or one ruler, right? So he's like, the lesser of two evils, right? You can either have 70 people ruling over you or just one. Which one is worse, right? You don't want the 70. That's going to be way worse for you. How about just one? And by the way, I'm your brother, right? Neither option sounds very good. Like, I, don't want, I don't want anyone to you know, tell me what I have to do and ruling over me and... and and especially to some wicked ruler telling me how much soda I could drink or <laughs> whatever, whatever they want to do, and then taking all my money to support himself and, and to, to get rich and live fat off of me. No thanks. But uh, that's what we, that's, and that's what we have today. Another application of this, to beware of these type of people, uh, another thing that, that came to my mind when I was preparing for this sermon is... Um, it's just like the this, this silly women that get caught up with married men or men that are in a relationship and they end up, you know, oh, he's going to divorce his wife and marry me and he's going to come at, you know, he's going to love me and, and, you know, he's fooling around and cheating on his wife and you think you're so special because you're the one he chose to commit adultery with. And so many women have this type of an attitude and it's like, why would you want to get married to an adulterer? Right. He already is cheating on his current wife. You really think he's going to not cheat on you? That he's not going to commit adultery when you finally get married? That he's not going to get bored with you? You don't think he felt a certain way towards his other wife? Towards his real wife? And then all of a sudden, now he's turning to you? It's the same type of an attitude. Do you really think Abimelech is going to all of a sudden just, just love you guys because you're his brother. When he killed his other brethren, 
he doesn't care. Family means nothing to him. Let's continue reading here. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of baal Beareth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. So these people of Shechem, they give him 70 pieces of silver. How cheap even of a price to kill 70 people. That's basically one piece of silver for every person that was murdered that was one of the sons of Gideon. One of the sons of the guy that led the charge, that led the battle, that fought for the Lord and freed everybody in the land from being under the rule of the Midianites. How cheap. So here's your price, 70, 70 pieces of silver. Which is probably why he had to hire the vain and light persons. The, the, the people who don't really care about anything. They're vain, they're light, they have no principles. They're wicked people too, who just for, yeah, I mean with 70 pieces of silver, I, mean, I don't know how many people that is, but that's not even like that much money anyways in the scripture. We see Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And they're getting 70 pieces for 70 people. And it's not like, I, I, I can't imagine it must have been that, you know, that it was that easy to kill all these sons of Gideon either because a lot of them are going to be grown. I mean, Abimelech was grown and he was one of the kind, a lot of these, these, these sons. I mean, the youngest, Jotham, was old enough to be able to stand on a mountain and like preach against them and call them out and was bold enough to do so. And, you know, so however old that is, I don't know, but everybody else was older than he was. So that's, um, they had to be vain and light. And, you know, wicked rulers want to surround themselves with wicked people because none of them care about anything. But see, that's also why what we see here, they devour one another because none of them have real loyalty. None of them know what it's like to actually stand for something that matters when everybody just cares about themselves. They'll, they'll knock you over in a heartbeat. They'll devour and eat you up too. So be careful who you surround yourself with. Be careful who you make friends with. Be careful who you get involved with. Get involved with people who love God and love people and don't love things and aren't vain and just care about money and care about just, just things that don't matter at all. People that are vain and light. Stay away from that, those people. That's not the ones that you want to have be your best friends. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, And he went unto his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. So Jotham was able to go hide when all this was taking place. And obviously they were, they were in one location at his father's house. Because it says they, he killed them all in one stone. So however he was able to, I'm guessing he, he probably set a trap for them. To be able to get them all, to be able to, 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 to bind them up, to, you know, wh however he was able to then kill them all on one stone and execute them. I mean, think about how wicked that is. Let's keep reading. Verse number six. And all the men of Shechem gathered together in all the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. Now, here they go and make a king. I don't think, like I don't consider Abimelech to be the first king of Israel. Because I don't think that he had rule over all of Israel. He had rule over the people of Shechem. He was a localized king. We see that Saul was really the first, he's, he's known as being the first king of Israel because that's when the judges finally stopped. That's after you know, uh, Samuel was the last real judge and then they wanted a king and they ordained Saul to be that king and that started the, the reign of the kings in Israel where Israel is, is one whole nation. And um, what we see here during this time, there's a lot more um, independence in general, just I think among the tribes of Israel 
probably closer to, to what the United States had before the United States, more of a confederacy, right? They were brethren, they were unified in a sense, but pro real loosely unified. And um, when Abimelech was made king, he was only the king over that one localized area. Because it does, we have no you know, uh, evidence that, that it extended beyond that really at all. So let's keep reading here, verse number seven. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. And now he's going to give them this, this parable in verse number eight. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? And he's going to give a few different examples here of different types of trees. He's saying the trees in general, just all the random trees, they say, we want to have someone to rule over us. We want a king. So they go to this, this great olive tree. And olive tree is saying, no, I, you know, I please God and man. And you can see here the implication is that, the, hey, the olive tree, they're doing the right thing. I don't want to be lifted up above all the other trees. Right? Why should I? I can please God. I can please man by being the tree that God made me to be, right? Not to just lift up myself over everybody else. This would be like Gideon, right? Because they came to Gideon saying, rule thou over us. And then, they, you know, they said, well, thou and thy sons, right? And Gideon said, I'm not going to reign over you, neither my sons. It says in verse 9, But the olive tree said unto them, Shall I leave my fatness? Verse number 10, And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? So all these people that they're going to are giving them the same answer, essentially. That, no, you know, I don't want to do that. I want to keep doing what God has me here to do. You know, I, I can do great things here, and I don't need to go and be promoted over the trees. But they also, um, you know, he goes from an olive tree to a fig and then to a vine. And then they go down, and, and so they're kind of getting like lower in stature. And then he goes to the bramble. Verse number 14, Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And brambles like real thorny, you know, kind of twisted thorny bushes or whatever. Uh, sometimes they produce fruit, but that, that's what bramble is. And then, they, you know, they, they die and get all... Uh, we, had, we had a bramble bush in the, in the back of our house. And um, we would kind of play in it, but I remember it always gets scratched and, and tore up because you inevitably are coming across thorns. Verse number 15 says, And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth... Ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So this is the answer then when the bramble finally agrees to it in, in this parable. Because he's, he's, you know, he's obviously giving them a truth and also cursing them by telling them this. And we'll get to the explanation in a minute, but he's saying to the bramble, okay, well, if it's in truth that you anoint me to be king, right? In truth, in honesty, that, that you really do want me to be this king and it's the right thing, then go ahead and put your trust in my shadow. He says, and if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So he's saying, hey, if this is all done in goodness and truth, then great, go ahead be king and, and you guys can all be secure. But if not, then fire is going to come out and devour all of you. And of course, the bramble would be burned up in that as well. And then he explains this here, verse 16. Now, therefore, if you have done truly and sincerely in that you have made Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam and his house and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. And ye are risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his sons, three score and ten persons upon one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem because he is your brother. And if ye then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam and with his house this day, 
Then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. So you're saying, hey, if everything was done really well and sincerely, then great, you deserve him. And then he goes, just, just so that they don't just start thinking like, oh, yeah, well, great. He reminds them, yeah, but you, you, you didn't do well to my father's house. You didn't do well to the guy that freed you from everybody. And, um, you know, he, he throws that in there and then says and then curses them saying, OK, but if you didn't do well, then let fire come out. Let you guys both be destroyed, which, of course, is end up what exactly happens. Look at verse 21. The Bible says, and Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. And just some more evidence here that he wasn't ruling and reigning and king over all of Israel because he was able to flee to Beer. He was just able to go somewhere else, not necessarily that far away in order to just be safe from him. And he also said, um, when he was talking to them, that the men of Shechem made him king, that it was, that it was again, just kind of localized for that area. Bible says in verse 22, when Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel, then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech that the cruelty done to the three score and ten sons of Jeroboam might come and their blood be laid upon Abimelech their brother which slew them and upon the men of Shechem which aided him in the killing of his brethren. See, so God's going to make sure that Abimelech and the men of Shechem both get punished. God's going to step in here and this is one of the ways he does. Very interesting the way that he does this. And this is one of the reasons why I believe we need to try the spirits whether they are of God and one of the things that God actually does here, it says that God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. So what he's doing is he's sending a spirit to go do a job to basically pit them against each other. I can't tell you exactly how this works, but we do know, we have another example. There's, there's a few other examples, but turn if you would keep your place here in 1 Kings 22. We're going to see another example of God sending a lying spirit, not necessarily an evil spirit, a lying spirit to uh, make sure that his will is done. And the way that we see it in 1 Kings 22 is that he uses these false prophets. So he could have done something very similar here when he sent that evil spirit, you know, to go into people and have them just start saying these things. Oh, yeah, you know, talking in the ear of Abimelech and talking in the ears of the, of the people of Shechem to just to get them angry with each other, pitted against each other, because that is how God ends up judging them. First Kings 22, look at verse number 20. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab? that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. So God wants Ahab to go into this battle so that he can just be destroyed and defeated and lose. He say, well, how are we going to do this? And it says, and one said on this manner, another said on that manner, verse 21, and there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him. And prevail also, go forth and do so. So he goes and, uh, and, and this is Elijah basically telling him, or, or excuse me, Micaiah, telling him this. And, um, you know, people start mocking him. But this is, Micaiah is preaching the word of God. This is, that's what actually happened, that God sent a lying spirit in order to persuade Ahab to go into a battle that he's going to lose, that he's going to be destroyed in. And uh, we see that God works this way. So be careful not to fall for the lies of the false prophets that might have a lying spirit in them that is just, and, and, and you know, it might not be intended for you, but a lot of people listen to them. You know, a lot of other people were deceived by these false prophets. In, in this case, the intended target was Ahab. But this is the way that God works. Let's, uh, you know, 
make sure that you're, you're right in the Word of God and following people who have the Spirit of God and not these lying spirits. And the only way you're going to know that is by trying the spirits, whether they be of God. So uh, let's go back to Judges chapter 9. And verse number 25, the Bible says, And the men of Shechem set liars in wait for him in the top of the mountains. And they robbed all that came along that way by them, and it was told Abimelech. So this is one of the, one of the things that the men of Shechem did, is that they, they set people, liars in wait, to be able to trap Abimelech, to be able to just get him while he's, while he's traveling through, right? So they're, they're setting traps for him already. And... Um, in the top of the mountains and you know because they're wicked people they're just robbing anyone that comes by that way anyways see abimelech finds out that these people are, are there basically setting a trap for him because they're there for him to, to to catch him as he goes through verse 26 and gail the son of ebed came with his brethren and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. So now, you know, the men of Shechem, they, they're getting sick of Abimelech, their brother, who they really just wanted to have rule over him, that he persuaded after three years. Only three short years, they're already just ready to dump him. So yeah, we're, we're, we're done with this guy. Oh, hey, Gail, yeah, let's, let's put our confidence in this man. Foolishly just going after these wicked people to rule over them instead of just taking responsibility for themselves and saying, you know what, we're going to follow the God and God will be our king. No, they just want to put it off for someone else, put these wicked people in charge because, you know, do you think it's going to be any better for them with Gale ruling over them? No way. Look at, uh, let's keep reading here, verse 26. And Gale, the son of Ebed, came with his brethren and went over to Shechem. And the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. And they went out into the fields and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and made merry and went into the house of their God and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. So they go and have this party and um, they're drinking and cursing Abimelech. Verse 28, And Gale, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech and who is Shechem that we should serve him? Is not he the son of Jeroboam and Zebul his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for why should we serve him? And would to God this people were under my hand. Then would I remove Abimelech. And he said to Abimelech, Increase thine army and come out. Now, it doesn't say this specifically. It says that they, you know, they, they went into their vineyards and they, they made merry and they drank in the house of their God. They did eat and drink. I think they're getting drunk. And I think you see this behavior of being very, you know, bold and mouthy and just kind of running his mouth and spouting off. And it, what's funny here is it says that he said to Abimelech, increase thine army and come out. Abimelech wasn't there, right? So he's, he's like directing his words at Abimelech and he's not even present. So he's just trying to be this tough guy. He's trying to be this, you know, keyboard warrior going, oh yeah, come on out, we'll get you. Because he's got all, all these, you know, all his buddies now, his newfound buddies in Shechem that are, that are there to support him. And yeah, we're going to get him. Come on out now. Well, the governor there, he, he hears the Zebul because he's also one of the ones that, uh, that this guy Gale is speaking against. Zebul is officer. Yeah, who are these guys? Who are these clowns? And Zebul's like in the city. He's there. And it says in verse 30, And when Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gael, the son of Ebed, his anger was kindled. He wasn't physically there present, but I'm saying he's still in the city, right? Like, like he hears out what this guy is saying. He's like, who's Zebul? You know. So he goes and sends word unto Abimelech privately just to tell him what's going on. And it says uh, in verse 31, And he sent messengers unto Abimelech, Privily saying, Behold, Gael, the son of Ebed, and his brethren be come to Shechem, and behold, they fortify the city against thee. So he's warning them, saying, Hey, he's riling up all the people here against you. He's getting all these people on his side against you. And he warns Abimelech and just basically tells him, You've got to come down here and deal with this. Verse 32 says, Now therefore up by night thou and the people that is with thee, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be that in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, thou shalt rise early and set upon the city, and behold, 
when he and the people that is with him come out against thee, then mayest thou do to them as thou shalt find occasion. So, um, and again, I'm thinking that he's telling them to come up quickly because they're all partying here and, and getting drunk and, and running their mouth. And he's like, you get here early, get here early in the morning, and then you'll just be able to have your way with them and, and you know, destroy them. And, um, but this is also another, just a, a good example of not running your mouth foolishly. I could just get you in trouble. Uh, this guy just, just kept running his mouth, running his mouth. He ends up, he ends up getting, getting destroyed here. Look at, um, what verse are we on now? I'm sorry, I just trying to follow. I didn't have all the verses in my notes, so I'm going back and forth here. It's not how I normally have this. Verse number 34. And Abimelech rose up and all the people that were with him by night, and they laid wait against Shechem in four companies. And Gael, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And Abimelech rose up and the people that were with him from lying in wait. And when Gael saw the people, he said to Zebul, Behold, there come people down from the top of the mountains. And Zebul said unto him, Thou seest the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. So Zebul is trying to buy more time for Abimelech. And he's basically just blowing it off, just like, you, you're just seeing things, right? You're just seeing shadows because the sun's starting to come up, and you just think that, that the shadows are men. So he tries to blow it off the first time. And it says in verse 37, And Gael spake again and said, See, there come people down by the middle of the land, and another company come along by the plain of Mayanam. So he's telling them here, look, it really is people. And now Zebul is going to face them in verse 38. It says, Then said Zebul unto him, Where is now thy mouth wherewith thou saidst? Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Is not this the people that thou hast despised? Go out, I pray now, and fight with them. So he's saying, well, you were a tough guy last night. Where's your mouth now? Because you're starting to sound like you're afraid that all these people are coming down against you. Why don't you go out now and fight against them? So he does, and then they go out, of course, to battle, and then the big loud mouth ends up running away. Look at verse 39. And Gael went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech, and Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him, and many were overthrown and wounded, even under the entering of the gate. This is your typical bully, loud mouth that wants to run his mouth. Yeah, he goes out there fighting, and he ends up just running away. He, he gets put to the worst. He gets chased. He leaves. He's a big nobody. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 41. And Abimelech dwelt at Aruma, and Zebul thrust out Gael and his brethren, that they should not dwell in Shechem. And it came to pass on the morrow that the people went out into the field and they told Abimelech. And he took the people and divided them into three companies and laid wait in the field and looked and behold, the people were come forth out of the city and he rose up against them and smote them. And Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood in the entering of the gate of the city. And the two other companies ran upon all the people that were in the fields and slew them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day, and he took the city and slew the people that was therein and beat down the city and sowed it with salt. So he's going and just destroying these people. Why? Because this is, this is exactly what happens to these wicked people. God's bringing the judgment against them that they're going to destroy each other. They only cared about themselves. Now they're just pitted against each other, and they're all going to end up dying. He goes and... You know, he's conquering and, and killing all these men of Shechem. These are all the men that, that put their confidence in him just three years earlier. And now he's so mad. I mean, he's not only is he destroying the city, it says he sowed it with salt. And the whole purpose of sowing it with salt so that no one's going to use it, right? You're pouring salt on the ground. It's not going to be able to be used anymore for, you know, for growing crops and things like that. He said, we're just going to destroy it, raise it, burn it, and, and not let anyone uh, live here again. And, and that's how, how angry he was at everything here. Verse number 46, and when all the men of the tower of Shechem heard that, they entered into an, old, into an hold of the house of the god Beareth. And it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech gat him up to Mount Zelman. 
he and all the people that were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder and said unto the people that were with him, what you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. And all the people likewise cut down every man his bow and followed Abimelech and put them to the hold and set the hold on fire upon them so that all the men of the tower of Shechem died also, about a thousand men and women. So he's going and just, again, clear, cleaning house. And he goes and cuts branches down so they, they stack up all this wood around this tower that they went in for, to be fortified. That was their defense. You know, they went into their physical tower. Of course, they didn't trust in God as their defense. They didn't trust in, the, in going into the tower of the Lord to, to fight their battles for them and defend them against wicked people. No, they, they trusted in their, you know, as it were, in their horses and chariots. They trusted in their physical arm of the flesh and their physical tower. And what happens? They got burned to the ground. You know, a thousand people that died in that fire. Uh, this, is, this is the fire coming out of the bramble. Remember the, the, the story that um, Jotham was, was telling, that parable that he's, he's giving unto them, you know, let fire come out and destroy you. And it, literally, that's what happened. The fire came out of the bramble and destroyed the wicked trees that wanted to have the bramble rule over them. And they didn't do it honestly. They didn't do it sincerely. And, uh, and that's what happened. This is the, the curse of Jotham coming true. Look at verse number 50. The Bible says, Then went Abimelech to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower within the city, and thither fled all the men and women and all they of the city and shut it to them and gat them up to the top of the tower. And Abimelech came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. So basically he's trying to do the same exact thing he just did. It worked the first time with the other tower. Let's do the same thing. So he's running right up to the base of the tower, right? And, and he's going to try to set this on fire. Verse 53 says, And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. So she takes this stone, this big this rock, or a piece of this rock, this big millstone, boop, drops it from the top of the tower, smashes Abimelech's skull, didn't kill him instantly, it says in verse 54, Then he called hastily unto the young man, his armor-bearer, and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew him. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. So he was mortally wounded. I mean, there's no way he's going to recover from that, and he knew it. He knew that he was a dead, he, he was a goner from, from that rock going on his head. And he's like, I don't, want, I don't want to go down in history as the guy that was killed by a woman. Right? So you do it for me. His armor bearer, like, you, you just kill me, then we could say that, that you killed me and I died by the hand of a man. But you know what's really funny about this? Keep your place here. Turn to um, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Abimelech was a total loser. A total loser. I mean, he was a wicked guy, but again, just one more reason, you know, things, things don't turn out well when you go off and just, just become a wicked person. He killed these people. He's not doing what's right by God. He, he tried to get things his own way. He tried to get his power. He reigned for three years. And I guarantee you those three years weren't as good as he thought they were going to be by being king. And then people are turning against him, and then he's fighting, and he's, you know, involved in all this stuff. And then he ends up getting killed by a woman. And even his very last desire was just, oh, I don't want to go down in history as a guy that died from, from a woman. But that's exactly <laughs> the way that people remembered him. That is exactly the way people remember him. We have proof of this in the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse number 18. The Bible says, then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war. So this is when David is actually finding out about Uriah the Hittite, that David wanted to have murdered. So Joab's bringing the news back that Uriah died. And the way that he died, though, is that he went too close to the fortification 
And he didn't want David to get angry with them for doing that. So he brings up this story of Abimelech. So let's read what he says here. Verse 19. And charge the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? So he's saying, didn't, like, why would you go so close in the battle? Why, why would you get yourselves that close? Why would you expose yourself that much? Don't you know that they're going to shoot at you from the wall? Verse 21, who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerobesheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of a millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? He said, isn't, isn't that how, did he say anything about his armor bearer killing him? Or, no mention of that at all. He's like, didn't a woman throw a rock on his head? And he died? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. This is well known. This is so well known. It's like these guys are men of war. They're saying, don't do this because look at what happened to Abimelech. Abimelech became this byword. He was an example of what not to do. And I think this is in the story for us today. Hey, this is what not to do. Learn from Abimelech. Don't choose to be some wicked person that's just about getting power and you don't care how you do it. You're going to you know, do whatever you can to, to make things work for yourself. It's not going to work for yourself. You might think you get away with some things. <coughs> You're not going to get away with things. And don't, and don't be this wicked person that just wants to rule over people and tell everybody what to do. To just, be, just have all this power over people. That's not what it's about. When Jesus was asked, or, you know, he was explaining to his disciples, you know, when they, were, they wanted to know who's going to be greatest. See, you know, the kings of the earth, they rule over people. They have this authority. People serve them. You know, they're exalted and lifted up. He said, if you want to be great, if you want to be great in God's eyes, if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, then you need to be a servant. You need to be a minister. You need to be putting other people above you and exalting other people and abasing yourself and being able to do the grunt work and do whatever, you know, to serve other people and be more concerned about other people succeeding than yourself. That's who's great in God's eyes. That is, and that is the total opposite attitude that Abimelech had. Abimelech cared about himself and power and prestige and having money and wealth and whatever else. That's what he cared about. And he didn't care who he had to kill in order to get it. Even his own brothers. And it's true. Because he didn't only kill the children of Gideon. He went and killed his other brethren too. He went and killed them all, all the men of Shechem. And it came to pass... Fire came out from the bramble, and then it came back and destroyed him as well. And they all ended up being judged of God. It's amazing how God can work things out. And these people still, it, it still works through their own wicked hearts. They don't need much. They don't, they don't need to have total divine intervention. They just need some other, some lying spirit speaking in their ear. They just need some evil spirit kind of prompting them, telling them, and, and you know what? Their wicked heart will run with it. Right, right. And they, they just keep going. Let's finish off the chapter here. The Bible says in verse uh, 55, And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father, in slaying his 70 brethren. And all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. So I kept saying, you know, the curse is a curse. He made it was because this last verse in here is saying that, you know, Jotham cursed him and rightfully so. He's the only one that survived out of that whole thing. And, and what a shame, uh, what a shame ultimately on Gideon for that to, to have happened to him. But I think, you know, Gideon could have made better choices. And avoided that whole thing. Let's um, be careful. The, the, the last thing I just want to point out here is just be careful. You could be serving God greatly today. You could be doing a lot of great things for the Lord. Don't deceive yourself into thinking 
that you're above sin, that nothing, you know, that you could just kind of take it easy, relax, go into retirement, get some gold, get some money. Gideon received, remember, he received all the, the golden earrings and he made that, that, uh, that mantle, the, the, the breastplate, and, and, you know, made that golden idol, basically, and went off and just kind of faded away. And um, ended up multiplying wives and, and taking a concubine and ended up with, with, these, with all of his children, almost virtually all of his children dying. I mean, Abimelech died. All the other children, Jotham was left. Nobody is above sin and no one's above that level of sin. Take heed to yourself lest you fall. Stay in it. Stay in the fight. Keep the right mindset. Keep the right focus. Steam others better than yourself. If you have a humble attitude, it's a lot less likely for you to get involved in these, in these sins. Even with Gideon, I mean, just, want it, just desiring to have more and more wives, more and more women. Why can't you be satisfied with one that God gives you. Amen. Just be satisfied with that one. Make that one work. If that one's not working, don't just go and get another one. Right? And just keep on going and get another one. And another. That's, not, that's not the right way to do it. Don't, don't have this, this overindulge in any area. It's going to end up bringing you down one way or another. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the um, great teachings in Scripture. Lord, I know that, that I barely scratch the surface on all the great truths that are, that are found in, in all of these chapters. Lord, help us continue to read every single day, whether no matter how well we think we know these stories, help us to continue to just read them and that you would just open up our understanding more and more, dear Lord, to, to get more truth, to get more wisdom. God, help us to um, stay humble and to be servants unto you and to not allow ourselves to get caught up into uh, a proud attitude thinking that we're above any, any of these sins or any of these things, dear Lord, and that we um, would be diligent in our service to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.